what we're hoping to, for this to be is a workshop, hands-on workshop on running experiments in the economics classroom. And our sort of target audience are people who are like, gee, I think I want to run experiments in my classroom, but I've never done it before. How do I do it, et cetera, et cetera. And if that is you, that is, that is our target audience, right? And so literally what we're hoping to do in this session is give you a little hands-on experience about how we run uh, experiments in our classroom, which hopefully learning by doing, right, might give you ideas and, and tips, et cetera, bring it back to, to your classroom. Um, so I'm Bob Ghazali, that's Calvin Wong, that's Rachel Landsman. Um, and we, one nice thing about this panel is we stress diversity. And so I'm the token white guy. Um, no, so, but we have, Rachel and I are experimental economists, so we use experiments in our research. Kelvin is not, a, he's from Minnesota. We have no idea what kind of economist he is. He's a, like a Minnesota economist. Um, but Kelvin and I both teach at large state institutions. Rachel's at a small liberal arts college. And so we've got a, 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 you know, a wide range of, of experience up here. Um, and so what I'm going to start with is um, we're going to start with a pencil and paper experiment. And <coughs> what I'm going to do, and what we're going to do a few times in this session, um, Calvin? Oh. What we're going to do in a, a few times in this session is Basically, we're going to run experiments as if you are a student in my in my class, um, right? And so I ask that you you indulge us, that you sort of pretend to be students, um, and then when's the exam? <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is on the exam. Yes, um, you know, so you pretend to be students, and then. At, after the experiment, um, we'll sort of talk about some things that we did, what we might think about as best practices. Um, we encourage questions. Um, questions are, are great. And so you know, once we break down the fourth wall or whatever and, and return to being instructors, yes, as we are think, talking about things that we like to do when we run human subject experiments, um, or, or uh, in-class experiments, please feel free to ask questions. All right, so, right, so this first experiment, right, what is going to happen is you are going to get a card. And this card will tell you, right, whether in this particular experiment you are a buyer or you are a producer. Now, if you are a buyer, your card will tell you the value of an item if you happen to purchase an item. If you are a seller, right, this card will tell you the cost to you of producing and selling one item. Now importantly, if you're a buyer, you can demand up to one item, and if you are a seller, you can sell up to one item. You are getting your card, and when you get your card for round one, I'm going to ask you to please record on your card right, for round one, whether you are a buyer or seller. And if you're a buyer, the value, and if you're a seller, the cost. Okay. So the way, once again, the way this is going to work, if you are a consumer, you can buy up to one item. And when we start, what I'm going to ask you to do is physically get up and out of your seat and look for a producer willing to sell to you at a price you both agree upon. A producer can sell up to one item, right? And when we start, I am going to say, get up and look for a buyer willing to buy from you at a price you both agree upon, right? I'm going to say that a handshake is a binding contract, right? And once you find, a, if you're a buyer, once you find a seller, if you're a seller, once you find a buyer and you agree upon a price, shake hands or fist bump, whatever. Um, and then after that, you bring the cards to me and you record the transaction on the worksheet. So once you make a sale or purchase an item, shake hands, and then one of you brings the two cards up to me, right, and I will record the price. 
right? And so if you're a buyer in each round, your payoff is equal to your value, which is indicated on your card, minus the price that you paid. Right? If you are a seller, right, your payoff in a particular round is the price that you agreed upon, the money that you get, right, minus your cost. And just a reminder, right, zero is larger than a negative number, <laughs> which means if you buy at a price higher than your value, then that is a negative number. And if you sell at a price lower than your cost, that is a negative number. Right? Just say. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Yes? You don't restrict sales. Uh, do you don't tell students that uh, uh, you, you don't want a negative number? So you're a student you right now. Number. You're a student. Okay, we'll we'll so talk about when you're instructor okay. later. Okay. But right. all I'm going to tell you is that a negative number is smaller than zero. Yeah. Yes. Um, other questions, comments, concerns? If not, have at it. Make some sales. Okay, I want to, us to recall where we, are, where we are in the classroom. But beforehand, right, I want to start with a question. Right? And perhaps you were a buyer. Right? And on your card was written a relatively high number, like you were willing to, your value was $8. Right? So why as a buyer, if you had a relatively high value, didn't you just agree to pay a relatively high price for, for, that, for that item? I ask you. Or, or likewise, if you were a seller with a low cost, why didn't you just agree to sell it at a relatively low cost? Because I wanted more. Because you wanted more, and so everyone, right, but okay, but why did you think you might get more? It was worth a shot. It was worth a shot, yeah. The payoff column? Yeah, the payoff column, but, but why did you think it was worth a shot to hold out, so as a seller, why did you think it was worth a shot to hold out for a higher price? There are lots of buyers. Ah, because other people, right? So, so yeah, so you, you think it's worth a shot, and the reason why you think it's worth a shot is because, right, there are other buyers out there, right? And so if you don't agree with someone else, right, you're fairly confident that you will be able to buy, right, at this price that other people are getting, right? And this is important because, right, in our previous class, we talked about perfectly competitive market, right? And so what we just implemented here was a, an approximation of a perfectly competitive market. Right, recall in the previous class we said the demand curve. Right, one way to interpret a demand curve right, is its buyer valuations, right, willingness to pay, ordered from highest to lowest. Right. We then added to that a supply curve. Right, and what we said is one interpretation of a supply curve right, is the value or the cost of providing an item ordered from lowest to highest. Right, That was one way in which we learned we can inter interpret a supply curve. Right? And in last class, we made a positive claim. Right? And that claim was right, <laughs> that a perfectly competitive market would find that price that equates quantity supplied and quantity demanded. And in class, I basically did a little bit of hand waving and said, trust me, this is what, sh what will happen in a competitive market. Right? And the important insight from our price-taking behavior, uh, from our assumptions of perfect competition, was price-taking behavior. Right? If you're a buyer, you can buy as much as you want at the current market price. It also meant that if you are a buyer with a really high value, right, you don't have to pay your really high value because you can find a seller who's willing to sell to you at the market price. Right? And so. What we did in, this, in, the, in our experiment is, well, if we have our, demand, our, will, our buyer valuations ordered from highest to lowest, it looks something like that. Right? If we took our sellers and ordered their costs from lowest to highest, this is exactly what we would get. And our perfect competition um, outcome right, suggests that the price should be here at approximately um, five dollars and I believe it's 90 cents oh, and I should have remembered that All right and so that is our prediction about what is going to happen and so if we look at what you guys actually did okay, I'm going to think um, unhide rows right. and we see 
right? In round one, we've got a, a average price of $6.54, and if I knew how to work this computer, I could make that appear bigger. Um, the average was a little high because there was someone who sold at a price where, where they lost a lot of money. Um, but, but over time, they learned that that was a bad strategy. Right? And then in round number two, we come really close to our prediction that we make with the under the perfect competition assumptions. We got a mean price of 5.7, a medium price of 5.75, which is pretty darn close to right, what our model predicts. All right, so what I'm going to, and so now I'm going to break the facade of, of in the interest of time, of you guys being students and, and us being the workshop organizers, and now we're all instructors again. Um, but something that I would now do in my class, which I think is, is really important, we'll talk more about that, is having some sort of wrap-up um, assignment to the experiment, right? One thing that has been proven to be important in terms of having experiments be effective at teaching economics, right, is not just the participation in the experiment, right, but having students um, actually reflect on what they did. And I started a little bit by why did you sell with, um, with you know, even if, why did you buy if your value was higher than, than the market price? Why did you sell, why did you, why did you not sell at a low price? Um, if your costs were low. Um, with this experiment, what I often do is, after the experiment, I have students break out into small groups to do a writing assignment to reflect on, on the experiment that they just participated in. And so for me, the reflection question that I would do after this right, is one that focuses on this idea of what is the marginal cost faced by sellers. Right? And for me, one important um, insight of principles of microeconomics is the idea that costs are opportunity costs, right? And so I asked students, right, to imagine that they participated in this market, but there's one big, huge change that we're going to make, right? And that is that sellers, right, in the experiment you just participated in, sellers only incur the cost if they make a deal, right? In many markets, right, sellers incur a cost early, right? and then try to make a deal, and what makes it potentially interesting is if they don't make a deal, and they don't sell their item, they have to throw out what they've just produced. Right? And I ask students to discuss and respond, and so in my class what they do is they get together in small groups, they talk about this, and then they individually write their answer. If you're a seller, right, how would it affect your, your decision-making process, the prices you would find acceptable, if you knew that, right, if you didn't make a deal, you were gonna have to throw out your item. Right here, what we want, what, what I would talk about with students afterwards is, this is why you go to a bakery at the end of the day, and sometimes you get pretty darn cheap bread. Um, and in the market described by these assumptions, what do you predict will happen to the price? And so this would be a wrap-up assignment that I might do with this perfect competition assumption, or with this perfectly competitive market. Right. And so now, the three of us are going to just briefly talk about right, things that we might be thinking about with this experiment, um, and thinking about best practices. Um, so first one, the one that I didn't write here, that in hindsight I wish we had written, right, is thinking clearly about what are the learning objectives of the experiment. Right? And so for me, right, one of the biggest learning objectives that I have for this experiment is reinforcing this positive claim that perfectly competitive markets find this price that equates supply and demand. Because for many students, it's like, okay, like why? Right? Yes, I can find P star, Q star, right? but understanding right, that this price-taking behavior is sort of what's driving competitive markets to find this equilibrium price. For me, that's really important, right? And so notice in discussing the results, I didn't really talk much about quantity. For me, I focused on price. Um, what do I need to do in preparation for the experiment? Well, I went, you know, I basically, I had to make sure that I had my materials done, right? And so that's going to be really important. 
right? I made sure that I had like the graphs done for equilibrium price and quantity, although I should have remembered exactly what the equilibrium price was. That would have been good. And in this case, I will say that I did not do this. You know, this experiment is inspired by the market experiment in Bergstrom and Miller's experiment with economic, economic principles. Um, Bergstrom and Miller wrote a book in 1997 that was well ahead of its time, and basically they proposed that we could teach the entire microeconomics principles course just by using experiments. And it's a great resource if you want to run experiments in the classroom. And so for me, I didn't, there were things about their experiment I didn't fully love, but <coughs> having their recipe, I was able to adapt it to my own, to my own um, uses. Um, the other thing, and to part, another reason why we ran this workshop, um, is Rachel and I are experimental economists. And traditionally, a very large fraction of the econ instructors who have used experiments in their classrooms have been people who run experiments in their research. And there's a lot of best practices that Rachel and I, like as Rachel said her, you know, what does she do in experiments? She does exactly what her advisor told her to do. And like, we are, we're indoctrinated in good practices of running experiments that we don't even think about, right? And, but for you guys who haven't run experiments, or many of you haven't run experiments, there are things that aren't necessarily obvious. And so if I'm going to pick one huge lesson learned, right, it's going to be the absolute importance of relatively clear instructions. Um, I cannot stress it enough. I had the, I've had the opportunity to visit a bunch of classrooms in which instructors are running experiments. And if there's one predictor about whether an, instruct, an experiment is going to go well or an, instruction, an experiment is going to go poorly, Often in the time in the in the quest for efficiency, an instructor will rush through the instructions, and the result is students really have no idea what they're doing. And perhaps in my rush through instructions, I didn't fully make it clear that if your value is six dollars and five cents, selling for ten dollars is not a good thing. Right? But in general, having clear instructions, I think, is one of the, the the biggest thing that you can do to make sure that the experiment works out um, as reasonably well. Um, I'm going to piggyback on that. Yeah. And is yeah. it okay if I steal the mic? Yeah, yeah. Um, in addition to having clear instructions for the students, another really essential component to having successful classroom experiments is to have a clear protocol or background set of instructions for yourself. So Bob knew that he was going to show up, he was going to have these cards, he knew when the cards were going to be passed out to each of you, and he knew how he was going to go about handling possible mistakes that might go on. So how do I talk about the data with my students if things don't quite match up the way I want? Yeah. And I have to say, one of the good things about this, this experiment almost always. The data looks great. The data time. always looks great. And I guess the one thing that I, the one just on the fly decision that I had was, do I run a third round? Right? And so this is where having a little bit of flexibility. After two rounds, it was pretty clear you guys figured out what the equilibrium price was. Round three would have been would have been a waste. Right? And the final thing that I want to you know reiterate is the research is really strong. Like running experiments is cool and great, and I think there is a benefit to having students making decisions as if they are economic decision makers. Um, and I think that has a benefit of itself. The research, however, is pretty strong that to get the most student learning out of student participation in experiments, there's got to be some follow-up reflection on this. Um, and so for me, when I run this experiment, it's all about a small group assignment where students get together and talk about the, the choices that we made. As we go on, we'll talk about some other things. Um, I'll, add, I'll add in another one, yeah. too. And I think um, part of clear instructions is having visual instructions. I think it's easy to tell someone something and assume that they picked up everything. Um, and I think having, you know, pictures, having bullet points or something that students can can see and remember and having those instructions up while you're running could be very helpful. Yeah. Um, but we also don't want to make it so that like, you know, if you don't have it all figured out and clear that you should not run an experiment because that's not what we're trying to get at. It's just one of those things where you want to 
have an idea going into it that it's not just on the fly, let's try plan. this yeah. plan. Yeah. Planning yeah. is important. This is a version of, I think, the original Vernon Smith. Yes. Like oral auction, so there's different versions out there. I th was found it interesting that you seem to have done it after you covered all this material. And most people, I thought, did it as a motivation, maybe right before supply and demand and introducing the notions of yeah, surplus yeah. So and we're gonna We're going to talk all about this placement in our next okay. best yeah. practices. But, best but, practices yeah. but, I, but I do think that, you know, but in so, you know what, what I'd say right now is, yes, and this would be a great experiment where if you asked you know, 20 uh, you know, instructors who use the market experiment, there's going to be a diversity of, of opinion on before versus after. And at least for me, right, it's all about what is the learning objective that I want, right? And for me, the learning objective I want is having introduced this in a hand-waving way, right, that perfectly competitive markets find a price that equates supply and demand, right? In essence, I want to use the experiment to prove to students that under situations, right? Whereas I do think other instructors will say, right, I'm gonna use this experiment and then I am going to build supply and demand off of that. And I, yeah, I couldn't agree more that both ways, yeah. And we'll talk more about the before versus after later. Other questions, comments, concerns? Yeah. How much time would you dedicate to this experiment, uh, three, you know, three rounds, instructions, and then debriefing? In a classroom setting. Okay. Debriefing is going to vary. I debrief some in my homework, even so I don't necessarily do all of my debriefs in the classroom. the The instructions and the experiment itself, I would say, mine is about fifteen to twenty minutes.